Hey everybody, Milkum Nana here, and welcome back to week one of the FPS Toolkit Devlog series. Now for today's devlog, I'm actually not gonna focus primarily to the features that I have implemented in the FPS Toolkit right now, because in short, I haven't actually added that many things into it yet to be considered feature rich for a devlog as of right now. But there is a feature that I want to showcase right now because it seems so obvious at first, but I haven't seen any resources about this in the internet that is clear enough, so here we are. Now for those who have used the FPS template that I've made in the past, there is a blaring issue with the interface in the editor. It is way too confusing to navigate, and overall, it was just a mess to look at. I mean, look at it. And so I scoured the internet to find solutions for this issue, trying to find ways to organize my variables in Godot. And luckily, someone has actually made a resource about it, and I'll put the original video in the description. This process allows your editor to become more clean than it ever was, with the export system because currently Godot doesn't actually have any system to create these folding menus yet in a more easy fashion. And so without further ado, here's a tutorial of how I did it. The solution for this issue lies to three main functions. The get function, which fetches the current value of the variable. The set function, which assigns the value to the variable if it was modified. And finally, the get property list function, which hosts all the properties that are being added into the editor. First, create a tool script by typing tool at the very top of your script, allowing the script to run in the editor. Then we need to create a variable that will be assigned later on. Keep in mind what variable type it is as it will become very important later. We then type in the get property list function and make a new array. This array will host all the variables that we want to show in the editor. Now to add variables, all we need is to append a dictionary to the array with the keys, name, and type, to which type associates with whatever type you assigned with the variable earlier. You can control click the property list function and click the variant type entries to dive into the specifics of what type of variable you wish to use. After that, you can return the array at the end of your function to send it back to the property list. All that is left is to save your script and reselect your node in the scene tree. You should see the variable you have made in the editor with the interface built in. This is where the set and get functions come in. Before your property list function, type in the get function with the variable property. By the way, you can call this anything else and it will still work. Then if the property is equivalent to the name of the variable we have made earlier, return that variable's value to the variable we have made in the script. Then we create a set function which has the variable's property and value. Make an if statement for the same thing, only this time we set the variable to the editor's value. Save the script and now you can change the variable's value to whatever you want. You can even print it in the ready function and it will still work since the tool script allows you to update it in real time. Now you might think that this is an overcomplicated process for something that I can do with a simple export function. But with the property list function at hand, you now have total control of whatever we want to show in the editor. For instance, you can create paths to which the last item would turn into the variable you assigned, and whatever before it will turn into a folding menu, which would allow you to organize your variables. Unlike the export function, which doesn't really allow you to make these folding menus yet as of the moment. Of course, this means that you do have to include the whole path in the other functions for this to work, but aside from that, the editor is your canvas to paint with whatever customization you want. You can also make things that are not variables, such as custom categories, which can further organize your properties. And that, my friends, is it. You now have the ability to customize whatever you want in your editor. And now I'll show you a quick demonstration of it in the FPS Toolkit. And here we are in the FPS Toolkit. I mean, it's not the flashiest thing in the world, but hey, we start from the bottom and now we are nowhere near the top. Over here we have a node that is renamed to camera, which basically has has all the camera settings as you can see right here and if you click this little folding menu called basic you have here all the basic settings for your camera obviously I'm gonna try and expand this with like camera shake and camera effects and whatever obviously this is kind of a future proofing step because I obviously want to plan this out to have advanced settings and special effects and all of whatever and on so right now it's just basic but in the later examples which is the movement we will showcase how you really use this in your advantage. You also might see that if I disable this, as you can see right here, we have the enabled boolean. It will hide all of the properties, which I think is a very nice touch. I think it makes the interface a lot cleaner. And this also applies to any other thing that I have here. So for instance, the smoothing, if I turn this on, it will actually give me a smoothing amount variable that I can adjust 
and it is just overall a nice quality of life change that is very easy to do. All that I have to do is to create the enabled variable for the enabled boolean which is also a boolean and if the enabled is currently true then the other settings which are the sensitivity, the smoothing, and the lock camera would also show up in the editor. Also works the same for the smoothing. If smoothing is currently turned on, the smoothing amount will also be added into the property list. You can also clamp the values in the actual editor through the set function. So right now, if you can see, if I push smoothing amount, it will only go up to 100. It will actually just cap to that. It won't go further than 100. It will also not go less than zero. And it's because in the set function, I actually have here the value and then I clamp that into zero to 100 as my min and max and then set the value to the smoothing amount which is the actual variable that I have here on the script. If we head on over to the movement panel, you can really see how you can go buck wild with this one. But if you notice, it's all the same thing. It's all the same concept where you can just customize the editor to whatever you wish and you can make it as customized and as neat as you want. Personally, I'm a bit of a neat freak when it comes to these UIs, so I like everything to be in menus and in little categories and all that stuff. You also might notice that there is this little drop down menu, which I haven't actually taught you, so let me go ahead and show you how to do that. So this pretty much works just like earlier, so if the enabled boolean is true, then all of the settings would actually show up, but also, this menu in particular is actually an integer with the hint of two and with the property hint string which is separated into two which are just retro and modern with this comma. I actually kind of cheated here because I have made a bit of a discovery in order to make these custom variables to show up in this type of configuration. Hold on, I actually forgot how to do it. Now to actually have this drop down menu, what I've been able to do was to first export a drop down menu. So in Godot 4, this is how you make a drop down menu. Obviously in Godot 3.4 or 3.2 or whatever, I'll paste it here on the video to show you how it actually works. But in Godot 4, all it is is export and num with whatever stuff you need in string format. So for instance, if I want apple, banana, milk, and then if I have a variable, let's call it food and we call this type integer and if we save our script you can see that our little drop down menu arrives and we have here a little drop down of apple banana and milk how this works is the first item would actually be zero and then the next one would be one and so on and so forth and now if we want to then get this for the property list Thing. All we need to do is to go and make a ready function and print the property list. So all you gotta do is to print the get property list and it will return us an array of whatever is in the property list, which is currently the dropdown menu. So now if we run it, you can see here that there's a bunch of stuff that you'll see. But the main thing that you have to look out for is the one that has your variable name on it, which is food. And there we have it. I don't know if you can see that. We'll just go ahead and zoom in there. But here is the full dictionary of whatever property we have in the editor, which is food. Class name can be removed from here. Type 2, which is integer. Hint. I got no idea what that is. And hint string, which basically means whatever is in the menu. I don't exactly know how all this stuff works, but all I did was basically copy this stuff and then basically copy paste this over the append function that I had for the array that we had earlier. So yeah, you can go pretty crazy with this. You have all of these functions. You can even have custom properties for these dropdowns. So right now you can see that if we have it on modern, you'll have have a whole bunch of other stuff pop up even in retro it will remove it automatically it's just overall Mwa delicioso in terms of the actual fps template itself it's actually uh, a bit more on the 
buggy side. As of right now, I'm trying to fix up all of the stuff that I am currently having issues with, but for the most part, a lot of the basic functionalities such as movement and camera settings are pretty much there. All of the extra bits such as the gravity and jumping and all that stuff I have to get figured out. But at least I have all of these things as the future proof settings configuration that I have for this template. And my goodness, if you compare this from the FPS template, it is just night and day. And so yeah, that is practically it for the week one of the dev vlog series for FPS Toolkit. If you have any suggestions or any feedback that you want to give to the project, then let me know in the comments. Also, I live stream some stuff. I just do gaming or just chatting or whatever back on the channel. And if you want to go ahead and take that a visit, then go ahead and subscribe there. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe for the next week's devlog. And I will see you next week. Take care, everyone.